the paranormal, UFOs, monsters, mysteries. You're listening to Talking Weird. And now, from a cabin deep in the Northwoods, your hosts, Dr. Dean Bertram and Jen Durrell. Greetings to all our weirdos and weirdettes. Thank you for joining us for Talking Weird on the Untold Radio Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dean Bertram, and joining me is the always amazing Jen Durrell. How are you tonight, baby? I'm doing very well. How about you? Good. Fall is here, although we've got some, we've all of a sudden got heat again here in the Northwoods. We've been freezing up here, and today Same we've been here. hit with like a heat wave. Mm-hmm. It's 83 it's right now. But that's good news because some of my pumpkins in my pumpkin patch weren't ready, but now this heat's turning them orange, which is fantastic. No, that's so, good. Yeah, I'll have all my pumpkins by Halloween. Oh. Which is well, always good. good. I had to get rid of my garden, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh. But Oh, well. Oh, well, yeah. It's do that have, season. Do you have any paranormal? You know what? I was going to ask you if you have any paranormal experiences this week, but maybe let's save them for the guest and we can run some of them. Sure. Him. It might be more fun other than us dithering here about it because I'm so yeah, excited about Yeah, why not? Let's do it, I think. I'm so excited about tonight's guest. I, I reference his work all the time on both this show and on Mysterious Library. He's a, appeared on countless paranormal programs discussing his work, so you're probably quite familiar with him. He's the author of seven critically acclaimed books, including Thieves in the Night, A Brief History of, Ch- of Supernatural Child Abductions, and Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomenon with Timothy Renner. Ecology of Souls, A New Mythology of Death and the Paranormal, which I have right here. It's a wonderful three-volume set. It's just incredible. Well, it's really two volumes, and then it's, there's a wonderful companion a piece to the, the work, which has the appendices mm. as well as all the footnotes in it. That's how extensive the research is in this book. Anyway, it's really his magnum opus, I think. It presents an extensive overview of beliefs about life after death and their intersection with UFOs, paranormal, and mystical phenomena, from psychopomps and doppelgangers through, through shamanism and psychedelic experiences to fairies, flying saucers, aliens, and beyond. So I'm delighted to welcome back to the show one of the most important thinkers in the broader Fordian field, Joshua Cutchin. Thanks. I I don't even know what to say to that. I'm I'm sort of gobsmacked by that introduction. That's that's (laughs) too kind of you. And and coming from folks like y'all, that really means a lot. So thank you. Thank you. No, we, I mean, I always reference your work as I was mentioning Mm -hmm. briefly before, before we started the show, you constantly come up and that's why, again, Mm -hmm. apologies for calling you Cutchin for about the last two (laughs) years. I finally got it right. Cutchin. No, it's it's all good. As as we were saying beforehand, um, my name has been butchered much worse. So no, no need to apologize. It was a great joy to see you at uh, the Strange Realities Conference. I wasn't there, but I was watching virtually the thing that the can the wonderful conference the Conspiranormal guys throw. Yeah, um, I was supposed to be a speaker, and I bagged on speaking because I had this great gig that was promised to go through, and uh, it was a gig with a corporate band and. Uh, corporate bands don't get to be at the level that they are without yeah. being run by shysters. <laughs> Basically, it's the way it goes. So, um, predictably enough, I should have seen it coming. Uh, it all sort of fell through. The deal changed at the last minute. So I was like, oh, Adam, can I come back to Strange Realities? And as it, <laughs> as it, as it turned out, because I just wanted to hang with folks and just be there at the meeting of the minds, you know. Yeah. Um, so as it turns out, I, I was sort of called uh, to come in at the last minute to do a, a panel with all the different speakers. And I think everybody, I got a lot of good feedback on that. So it was great to be there. No, I think you did a great job when you when you kind of compared that panel at the end. Was there any? I, I think you were there for most of it. Were there were there any speakers or any ideas? Let's not say speakers. Say any ideas you saw floated there, which which really jumped out at you. Yeah, uh, Chris Ernst did a presentation on the intersection of some Eastern mystics and a lot of these phenomena, and and. I have to admit, like the whole Eastern cosmology, especially as filtered through Hinduism, I mean, I've got a little bit of a better grasp on Buddhism, but um, that's always sort of been like a blind spot for me. Um, 
and not in terms of the fact that I don't acknowledge its existence or that I don't try to engage with it, but just I've never been able to like really get a sense for its scope and how it all fits together. So that was a, a fantastic presentation. And he also uh, screwed documentary that he made uh, about Soraya Azkath, who was the host of Where Did the Road Go? And, you know, one of my earliest friends involved in all this. It was, I really enjoyed Chris's presence there. And he also plugged Ecology of Souls during the panel. Yeah. So <laughs> I've got to plug him back, I guess. But, no, I, I, I missed his actual, I mean, I watched probably 70% of them, 60% of them over the weekend. And I certainly watched the documentary, which was fantastic, but I missed his presentation. So I'll have to go back into the the strange realities archives because i think people who paid to go to it can still go back and watch those yeah it, it, he was great and uh adam go rightly's presentation was great too he had some new stuff on james shelby downard and you know i kind of want a t-shirt that says modern american paranormal thinking is just theosophy and uh and downard <laughs> <You know? laughs> it really does seem to like so many of our ideas just trace back to those two sources yeah, it was great to hear Go Rightly talk about down. I, I think I first found out about, we shouldn't go too down this far down this rabbit hole. <laughs> it's pretty obscure. It, is, it was a deep one too. It's a very I think deep I rabbit hole. I, I think I first found out about him. And I think it was a piece in Apocalypse Culture I read, or maybe Secret and Suppressed, one of those kind of anthology books which were popular in the 90s. And down, it seemed to be a guy who just was so out there. He reminds me in some ways in of Bill Cooper in so far as he would actually yeah. carry around a 45 with him and be ready for, well, in, in, um, in, in Cooper's case, it was, he thought, you know, the government was coming from, which ultimately right. I guess they did. But in, um, in Shelby Downer's case, it was, he thought the, the Masons were going to come and get him. So he was always yeah. armed. So, but it's, it's, real... but it's just amazing to see the tentacles of his thinking and his claims, like winding their way through ufology, even into people that you would think would kind of be, um, isolated or insulated, I guess, from some of that thinking. Uh, just because, you know, a lot, in a lot of the same ways that Cooper sort of influenced this uh, sort of milieu that we're in, he he seemed to have a similar uh, impact as well. So it was just, yeah, I, I, I don't want to be too sour on it, but Theosophy and Downard is kind of <laughs> what, what we think the way that we do about this stuff. It, it's pretty true. I, of course, I think there are people, as far as the paranoia that bled into ufology, X-Files, ufology as i call it all those beliefs in treaties with extraterrestrials and the u.s government and secret underground bases and yeah. massive genetic breeding programs and all of this stuff i always find it fascinating that it seems to originate with the, in this small cadre of people either in the intelligence services or assets of the intelligence services who started to, to push out stories like re, around for example the benowitz case or pushed out stuff to linda moulton house so i suspect the influence of it's weird for me that something like ufology can be so influenced by just a few key people who mightn't even be sincere. They might just be playing games. And before you know it, the entire community, well, I shouldn't say before you know it, it probably took 10 years for it really to, to get talons in, but it really became certainly throughout the nineties, the default way of looking at UFOs. Yeah. And you've got to wonder, you know, what, uh, what sort of support apparatus a lot of these individuals have behind them. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why I feel like there are so many few, there's so few rather things that you can really treat as truths in this, in this mm -hmm. field, you know, I mean, and even if, even when you get dir stuff directly from the uh, UFO occupants themselves, like there's no reason to believe that they're telling the truth. <laughs> like, come on, <laughs> how many, how many prophecies have to fail before you're like, oh, I don't think these things are on the level. That that leads into something I wanted to ask you about Ecology mm -hmm. of Souls, actually. But perhaps before I do, can you give the readers who haven't read it yet? And I, I know some have. For example, Horace Smith, who was a guest a couple of weeks ago, just recently commented and saying, you know, he had to thank you for the wonderful footnoting and references within the book. He's actually uh, emeritus professor of astronomy and physics from Michigan State University, so he's somebody who likes to sink his, you know, his intellectual teeth into references. But for those of you, for those of our audience who haven't read the book yet, can you give it kind of the elevator pitch, essentially what your what your thesis is in maybe, you know, a couple paragraphs? Well, um, so I'm going to try to compress 260,000 words into a couple paragraphs. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that, so there were a couple things that always stuck with me. And one of them was my most common uh, counterpoint whenever somebody was in a staunch extraterrestrial hypothesis advocate, which is to say that there are plenty of stories. Um, you know, I have some appendices worth, but th that, even that's just scratching the surface. There are plenty of stories where people see the dead, 
during these abduction experiences. And that at least says that if it's little green men, it's, you know, freaking strange little green men, right? <laughs> like it's, it's not really anything that we have the tools to grasp. So there's that. Um, another thing that really always intrigued me was uh, what Ann Streber uh, noted while going through the correspondence that experiencers wrote her in the wake of communion. And Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death. Um, but, you know, I think in a lot of ways, this, this sort of deep dive looking at um, the dead in relation to the UFO phenomenon has been begging to be sort of scrutinized a little bit for, for a long time. And uh, the example that I always use and the thing that I'm kind of fond of saying now is that this is sort of the, the connection that haunts the background of Passport to Magonia. Um, because, you know, Jacques Vallée did a great job of saying these, you know, this, this modern sort of uh, expression of this phenomenon looks quite a bit like older folklore. But, you know, what I've, what I've been saying lately is, okay, well, what would a 1300s passport to Magonia doing that with fairies do? You know, what would they say? They'd say, oh, well, the fairies look a lot like the way that we've always thought of the dead. And so if you use that transitive property, then it, it certainly implies that there's a link there. So, you know, how much is there to this? And I said, okay, well, I'll get in and out with one book, you know. And, uh, you know, by the time I started looking into it, it was like, oh, there's an entire basically book's worth of preface that sort of has to go into this. Because the way that we've thought about the soul um, has changed so much and is really restricted by the sort of, you know, modern Abrahamic thought. Um, and there are ideas that we just don't entertain anymore, like the idea that the soul was like a smaller version of ourselves somehow, or the idea that... Uh, that we have multiple souls within us, this old, older idea of polypsychism. And all of those have a great deal of bearing upon this. So that's how it evolved into this two book work. But also the more you keep scratching at that, the more you find that a lot of these different things um, that we attribute to being uh, paranormal phenomena always sort of come back to, uh, to, to, to death in a lot of ways. And of course, I know this is where I think you said that <laughs> I had the tiger by the tail. Um, but you know, that was, that was the thesis and I, and I bought into it. So I tried to find as much stuff as I can. There's something, there's something there and maybe I overemphasize it. And, you know, to that extent, my editor, Barbara Fisher from the six degrees of John Keel podcast, um, she uh, said, you know, it really isn't about death. It's about the cycle of life and reincarnation, it seems to be. But that's why I say, well, that's why, you know, it's called Ecology of Souls. You know, the death isn't in the title, it's in the subtitle. <laughs> so I hope that somehow suffices as a thumbnail sketch for what this sort of massive project ended up becoming. No, I, th I think it summed it up well. It's such an important work. And uh, we'll talk about some of the theory that I mightn't agree with or might think it implies other things. But the reality is that this is the type of book that ufology and 40, the 40 and world in general need. I think, as Greg Bishop said in the the afterward to Mac Tony's The Crypto Terrestrials, which was published posthumously after Tony's died, he said the strength of Tony's is that is that we need more theoreticians. We need more people actually playing with these ideas. And I, I think that's so true. The ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, has just hit a wall. It's done nothing in so long. It's this endless cycle of waiting for the government to give us the information. The government's lying to us, but the government's going to give us the truth. It just has been going since Kehoe penned his first words and before. So people need to go out there and start playing with ideas. And I think this is more than you playing with an idea. This is this is a, a theory which is backed up by an exhaustive amount of scholarship. I mean, the research in this book, it, it really reads like a very readable, but still it reads like a dissertation. It's so thorough. It's so dense with its notes, which is important because you're not just throwing this. You're not just saying, hey, I think it has something to do with death and walking away. You're exhaustively referencing cultural experiences and folklore and modern experiences and religious traditions and all these myriad of things that connect this very powerful hypothesis. So I can only imagine how long this thing took you to, to, to research and write. Well, you know, I think that my favorite uh, snarky Reddit comment that I've read so far about ecology of souls was that my conclusions were nonsensical. And I'm like, okay, well now wait a minute. You can not agree with them, but nonsensical. Like I try to walk people through, yeah. you know, yeah. how I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, I worked on this like a man possessed. Um, so it was about 18 months turnaround for the whole thing from, from researching to writing to, uh, getting it out the door. And that's, that's partially because, you know, I had a, a wife who was very, um, invested in giving me the opportunity and the space 
to treat this sort of like a full-time job. So we had some, some help with, with the boys. I have twin toddlers. Um, so we had some help with the boys and I was able to treat this more or less like a, a nine to five, uh, during that period. So that, that helps a lot, you know, and of course, stretching those hours into the morning hours or the evening hours as needed. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I kind of feel like <clears throat> I'm not necessarily antagonistic to the, to the ETH. It's just that like, Everybody who endorses it is so sure of themselves, and I think it's an open and shut case, and it's received so darn much attention over the past 70 years. And it's like, okay, well, there are a lot of other theories and hypotheses that uh, are just interesting. And, and I think are, you know, I think that the ETH certainly has plenty of strengths, but I think that at the same time, it has some answer, uh, some weaknesses that it has to answer for. And similarly, some of these other ideas uh, have strengths and weaknesses that sort of make up where the ETH doesn't, you know, I mean, I'm, something I didn't even get to talking about in this book because it was so darn long enough as it is, but uh, time has something to do with this, something to do with this. And I, my, my, you know, my eyes go crossed and my brain turns off whenever I talk about time and <laughs> retrocausality and all those things. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we're just, we're just going to not talk about time, but that's, that, there's something to do with time and all this too, I think. But um, you know, it's almost this idea of like, okay, well, the ETH has had so much of this for so long. Let's let's talk about some other alternative ideas. And this is one that's, you know, surprisingly enough, floated around ufology for a long time. Like you can go back into some of those earliest flying saucer review uh, publications and, and find vestiges of people talking about this, talking about like the idea of technology from the afterlife and all these other sort of ideas that really don't sit well with us. But, uh, you know, we're certainly a little bit more uh, open to discussion across the pond uh and as as it's always been they've always been more open to the metaphysical components of this mm -hmm. you mention at, at the very end of the book you jokingly say well i never intended to kind of write joshua cutchin's theory of everything or something that's kind of what i've done but i also like that you said you know this is where i am now but i might I might change my thinking and i know that was something you point out about whitley streber is that he's tended to go through all these different variations of thoughts of what the visitors might be since writing that book have you you mentioned time then are there are is there any other things that have have kind of grabbed you as maybe it's it's something else no it really the, the the time thing has been what's been haunting me and and you know this is something that i make no bones about the fact that you know one of my primary mentors and one of my dear friends is greg bishop and uh you know that's something that greg very much sort of instilled in me at I, guess, I would say an early age but i guess early in my ufological career as as it is um that you know you want to always sort of be adapting and changing your ideas um you know i look at a lot of the folks that i have respected spiritually and politically and uh just in terms of relationally in my life and there are always people who have always changed and sort of adapted and, and sort of incorporated new data as it comes their way so you know i i hope that i i some of the ideas in here that i sort of support i have radically reevaluated um at the same time what i what i ended up finding myself doing is is sitting back and saying oh i don't know if this ecology of soul sort of model that i put forth um if it is consistent at all, I, I don't know if it, if it is objectively true, but dang it, it works for me. You know, um, it helps me to integrate a lot of outliers that I've always had problems with. And, um, there is, um, sort of a through line that runs through this too, is, is I, I really wrote it a lot for me. And if, if you're aware of this, you might sort of read the book a little bit differently. If you go back and read it a second time, a lot of this is me trying to reconcile this with my own faith. You know, I am a Christian and, uh, at the same time, I'm a Christian who thinks that it's a really strange cosmos and reality that we're embedded within. And I, I've talked to a lot of these people firsthand. Um, you know, I mean, a, a dear friend of mine is Mike Cleland, and Mike's had some truly harrowing experiences. How do I incorporate that without going down some sort of reductionist, oh, it's angels and demons sort, sort of route, you know? So really, a lot of this book is me trying to, you know, with, with that sense of objectivity, you know, it's in the afterward that I come out and sort of talk about my own feelings, but with that sort of sense of object, objectivity, how do I sift and winnow this into something that sort of looks accurate and, you know, at the end sort of preserves uh, some of the bedrock of my own faith? Yeah, you never would guess reading that book until you get which, to the end that you were. Which I love, which I love. <laughs> I loved yeah. hearing that. I loved hearing that. And not like, you know, I'm sure that there's some Christians who would say, as I address in the afterward, there's some Christians who would say, oh, that's a bad thing that your work isn't Christian enough. But no, to me, it's like I'm trying to approach this 
as clear headed and as objectively as I can, because there are plenty of books looking at this stuff through people's own sort of pet metaphysical lenses. And that's not quite what I wanted to do. I wanted to try to be as, in some ways, as dry as I could be about it. You know? I just, one of our regular listeners asked a question and that's Nancy Malcolm said, did you feel a sense of urgency in getting the book done to present these ideas? A hundred percent. Um, I, uh, I had just a, a lot of things going on in my life in 2020 and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to call anyone out who didn't do this, but I think there are certain people that I know in my inner circle who saw what we all went through in 2020 and said, Oh, now's the time to sort of get my own house in order. You know, if I'm going to have a rebirth moment, I'm going to do it now. If I'm going to have a time when I kick a bad habit, you know, now's the time to do it. Because I think on a, on a sort of global level, regardless of how you feel about things went down, that's sort of what was happening, you know, um, is, you know, this sort of change. And it was, it, I think there were some opportunities afforded by that. So this is one of those things that I have been thinking about this particular book for probably about ever since I got started in it. And it's probably why it ended up coming together so quickly is because I've kind of been keeping a lot of these little bits and pieces in the back of my head for so long, but there was a certain urgency. I mean, you know, you've got that, uh, very sort of Keelian thing where the phenomenon looks back at you. Right. So I'm like, Oh, I'm writing a book about death. I wonder what could possibly go wrong. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit of that, but also just, you know, I, I just feel like, um, yeah, yeah, there, there. I was, I was very, very driven to to get this turned around as quickly as I could because it just the timing was right for me personally, and I felt like it was kind of right globally in a lot of ways. As a Christian, also, I, what I value most about the book, other other than obviously the incredible research that went into it, and there's a very strong theoretical through line for sure. It's very readable, even though how long it is is an incredibly readable book for a book of this. <laughs> I appreciate that. I lost some sleep over that. <laughs> yeah. But but what I think what the value in it for me is whether death is the central tie altogether, which is kind of what the, obviously, as we talked about the tiger by the tail or the through line of the book is, it certainly demonstrates that all of these things tend to be operating at more than a physical level. It isn't that sometimes they're not physical because clearly you say that they are as all I think as most great thinkers, whether it's from Jung, you know, through Kiel, Valet, Patrick Harper, any of these people suggest there's a physicality to it as do you, but that, you're able to see what is a genuine ecology. Now it could be an ecology of souls like you suggested, but it seems to make sense that there is this other world, which all of these things are somehow a part of. And I, I'm sure death is a part of it as well. I'm not doubting that some of this has something to do with death. The same way I don't doubt that there's a spiritual world which has the dead in it as well as, you know, various heavenly hosts and various other things. So I think to me, that was the incredible strength of it. I'm not sure, to be totally honest, if, I, if I'm convinced that death is the central you know the central driving force because you, you and don't get me wrong you make a very clear argument that it could be but i as i and you asked me to bring it up so i'm going to there are other things that i think could also be that central driving force like not necessarily the simplistic angels demons thing but the more complicated cosmology that mike heiser talks about where there's almost essentially a pantheon below god and there's gods of the nations which are talked about in the bible so all of the world's given over to these other gods to run except the israelites and there's a divine council that works with gods with god and the elohim can be singular like god or it can be plural elohim just means spiritual being so all of these things you're talking about are really in a sense elohim so i could i could imagine that type of theory running with the the kind of broader overarching i suppose material and and channel it in that direction to go aha this is kind of you know th this this gives more more proof to the ongoing existence of that type of spiritual world yeah i think those are some really wonderful points um and uh yeah, I, I guess if if I were to come up with a counter to that it's that i think that when i try to think about okay well what this phenomena if we're going to lump it all together be sort of driving at besides death it's just driving at some sort of function of maintaining reality or being a steward of reality in some ways if you especially you bring in ideas of heavenly host and you actually do think that there is some sort of spiritual metaphysical component to this but even if you want to break down 
to my mind, like what 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 with sort of this current reality is in its most fundamental form, to me it seems creation and entropy, and those two things being constantly, you know, um, at odds with one another. So, you know, I kind of wonder if if that might be what is an even more fundamental sort of maybe that's what I picked up on, right? Or maybe that's what all these other people have picked up on is that sort of that sort of tension between creation and entropy. Um, because I think a, a strong argument could be made that those two things are are a lot of what drives the, the these phenomenon throughout the years. You know, the idea of from from hybridization to this sort of death angle that I sort of <laughs> beat the drum about. Like it does seem to be that that tension as well. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm not again like part of it for me is, and I kind of hate that I I ended up finding this idea so attractive because again, like I want my ideas to change, but like it just allowed me to take things that I had no answers for and be like, okay, I can sort of apply this logic to that. And it, it allows me to sit with that ambiguity a little bit more comfortably, I guess. No. And I think that's the great thing about the book. It isn't, it isn't that you're, it isn't, it seems almost that the theory is data-based rather than, rather than the fact that you just had a wacky theory and then you went and searched things for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I think that another um, valid uh, complaint would be that, like, there's obviously some cherry picking in here. I mean, you know, there, there are plenty of high strange cases that have nothing to do with death. Right. Um, but, you know, at the same point, I would imagine that they have something to do with consciousness. And if consciousness is fundamental, then I think it probably brings those two forces of creation and entropy back into play. I don't know. I'm sort of spitballing here. But, yeah. like... They, there are there are valid criticisms to be made <laughs> that's for sure, which is which is why I loved hearing them from y'all. I'm like, yeah, that's no, that's that's totally you know. And I think that's, I think it's important to honest enough with yourself to see those sort of things. You know, the the other, I don't want to say problem, but the other thing I was conscious of when I was reading the book is you yourself saying there. I think it's somewhere towards the end of the of the second volume that for the most part you've you've kind of looked at this as fairly positive like you've included some negative cases but you see yeah. this as fairly positive. I I know something we do share is we tend to think a lot of the stuff which is presented is lies or the things behind it are lying to yes. us. So yes. that's one of the things I found more difficult to reconcile if there if there's this kind of deceit then it's hard for me to accept that as as positive if that makes sense. Right. I, I guess, I guess part of what I was driving at is that, and I think it's a very good point because I mean, we've all heard these stories, these absolutely horrific stories that involve us, you know, consent being circumvented. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's the main reason why I don't ever take home any souvenirs from paranormal hotspots. Like, you know, I'm fine with a ghost popping up in my home or seeing a UFO, but like so many of these stories, it's not that like you just get bad luck and it means loved ones getting terminal diagnosis and, you know, financial ruin and, uh, you know, relationships falling apart. And that's the stuff that I can't handle. Like, you know, give me ghosts and UFOs all day. If, but like, that's the sort of thing that makes me go, maybe I shouldn't take this piece of, you know, the blown up dome from the TNT area home because I don't <laughs> sort of bring that, <laughs> that bad, that bad mojo with me. Um, so there, there is a negative component, but again, I feel like if you, if you sort of try to take a really objective, I, I would even hesitate, I would even perhaps say like meta positioned uh, perspective on this stuff, a lot of this negativity tends to focus towards one of two things um, that uh, undermining consent, which obviously is highly problematic. But, you know, as I do say in the book, like there's, examples in our own lives where we take children to pediatricians and vets that seem to do the same thing. And we understand because we're in a position to understand that this is for their well-being, you know. So there's that, that leaves some wiggle room for, you know, well, maybe this stuff is positive, even when it's going against the, the wills of those who experience it. And then there's the death thing, you know, it kills people. Well, you know, if you're looking at things like karma, and if you really do believe that there's some sort of afterlife, death is not really the worst thing that can happen to you you know it's I, I would argue that like ruining relationships is one of the worst things you know um compromising your integrity is a lot all those things are probably if if the afterlife does exist and i obviously suspect it does those things are probably far more worse than you know dying in a car accident or something um or you know dying at the hands of a, an angry big <laughs> or whatever you may have so like so i didn't 
I kind of didn't even want to say that because I knew it was going to engender some some comments like this. Not that I'm saying that you shouldn't, because I think it's it's a very good thing to sort of kick back and forth and debate. Um, it's almost sort of like the ETH thing again, right? You know what I mean? Like we we hear all the time that these are negative and we got to be on high alert, and you know we have so much pop culture um, inundating us with the idea that these things are negative. It's like, well, maybe we should push back against that a little bit because I look at the people that I've always looked up to, and you know, if you give me a choice to pick between Bud Hopkins or John Mack, like I know which direction I'm going to go in. You know, if you give me, uh, <laughs> if you if you give me, you know, David Jacobs or uh, or Leo Sprinkle, like I know which direction I'm going to go in, which 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 side I'm going to take if I have to draw those lines. So, and that's obviously both in those cases, those tend to be, you know, at the at the furthest perspective, that ten thousand foot level, those tend to be more positive paradigms that they're working under. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a that's a very good point. One thing when I was reading the book, it actually made me think of Jen, who's a paranormal investigator. Is you talk about and this I, this I found fascinating because it's something I've thought about myself, but haven't taken any time, you know, really to research. It's a little bit out of my my purview usually. But that is that these things seem to be able to contact us through all methods of technology, whatever the technology is. So whether it's, you know, people automatic writing or whether it's weird phone calls or with the advent of radio, voices start coming through the radio. And I know Jen at the moment is um, is using phone apps to do these type of contacts. Did you want to talk, ask Josh anything about that? Yeah. Show? And I, I would, I would love to hear, to hear what more of what Jen's doing. Um, but before, well, yeah, you go, you go ahead. Cause I have some thoughts, but yeah. No, well, I mean, mine, mine's just purely um, just my own investigation, just because I have my own curiosities um, to also for some more validation. Um, so I, I been messing around with some apps and uh, one of them, um, that seems to be um, on it. Like when I ask questions, um, they seem to make sense with the location and, and what's surrounding me. So I, I use it quite often. Um, so with, with those apps, I've, I've kind of come to my own conclusion with those is that I'm not necessarily need to be in a haunted location in order to get any communication. It's almost as if I'm, I'm speaking with someone and another realm that happens to have a radio of their own that's trying to speak to me. Um, it's quite interesting. Sometimes I, I do interact with something that is lost and confused and doesn't know where, where, why they're there and they were. How did I get here? Did I die? You know, that kind of thing. And then I interact with something that is aware of what I'm doing. They let me know that they're watching me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stuff me the like that, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I've interacted with tricksters, mm -hmm. and they do like to pop in, and they're like, "Want to play?" And I'm like, "Not your game." You know, as long as I stay strong and just kind of play around with it a little bit, um, they eventually go away because they know I'm I'm not scared of them. Don't show any fear, and they're like, "Oh, never mind. I'll go mess with somebody else." Um, but recently, I've been dealing with. Um, something that's always telling me it's watching me. So I <sighs> just came to a con conclusion, which I was telling Dean about like on the way home today, I got a name that said Noah. Well, I've had Noah before. I never thought anything about it automatically. I'm thinking just, you know, does that have anything to do with locations that I've been at? No, it's not. So it end ended up letting me know. I asked where it was like, where are you? Are you in my car? Are you in another realm? You know, I always ask that. And it said up, so the up, you're up. Okay. Where above. Okay. Where above, uh, you know, automatically I'm thinking another realm. Are we on top mm -hmm. of each other? Like, how are we interacting? And then it lets me know that um, it's watching me. So then I try to get my brain away from ghosts, spooky stuff. And so I said, well, could you happen to be a spirit guide? Something on, on that level. And it comes back with, it says up again, it says protect angel above. And I'm like, what? So prior times I've, I've had Noah. So I Googled Noah angel, like never heard of a Noah angel. And there were several that came up, which I haven't researched enough. It's just something I just came upon tonight. Mm -hmm. 
And it said that Noah at one time was Gabriel. So that's something, a rabbit hole I'm going to have to go down. I've never even heard of that before. Um, but I have had Gabriel come through was the other thing many times mm. on the app. So that is fascinating. Is, is this some um, like audio or is it? Well, it's, it's something that's really popular right now. Uh, it's called ghost tube. So Amy from, heard of this. Um, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. uh, she's got her own YouTube channel. Amy's crypt is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And so we I'm a little leery of these anyways, but I just, you know, just right. do it for fun to see if there's anything that's going to correlate with what's happening around me or the location. And this is the only one that's been on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's constant, like it'll be completely quiet till I say something and then something will pop up. If anybody else uses right. it, it yeah. wasn't, doesn't really work. So I don't know if it's me or, or. <sighs> yeah. Or I what. mean, that's, I can't help. So, so I've, I've got a couple of thoughts and I, I do think okay. that like, just as these phenomena tend to sort of recontextualize themselves as we have cultural expectations that recontextualize right. themselves. I think that it makes just as much sense that they would come through in, you know, petroglyphs as they would in an app. Right. The problem is when you get people who are, so I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but there okay. was a, <clears throat> there was an app that was out there for photographing um, ghosts. And the idea was that you uh, had to generate some sort of like steam or smoke or vapor and you would take a picture with the app and it would show you the faces in this steam or smoke or vapor. And I remember the pitch included the phrase, this app eliminates pareidolia, <laughs> which is like not, not yeah. a thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, unless it like, unless it like goes into your brain and short circuit something, it's not going to eliminate pareidolia. <laughs> so like you, you get some claims like that alongside people who, I, I guess what I'm saying is like claims of apps like that, sort of sully the idea of using this more modern technology. And, you know, I would mm. say that it's almost like what you see almost in the occult world is like a sort of a, a reflection of what you see in, in amongst the, you know, the, the occultists, you know, so you mm. have like the occultists who are like, Oh no, oldest is the best, you know, we, let's get our rituals out and let's put on our robes and grab our wands. And yeah. then you have the chaos magicians and the people who are talking about, um, you know, uh, new thought and intentionality and things like that, who seem to have just as good or in some cases better, you know, a track record than some of these people who are sort of, you know, LARPing thelemites. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I think that like the, the idea of, of, of technology really shouldn't put people off in your case specifically. And I can't specifically talk to like the, the Noah Gabriel thing. I think it's an amazing, fascinating sort of uh, rabbit hole that, I hope yeah. you find yourself tumbling down yeah, in recent in, in coming in the coming <laughs> weeks. But like, I do think that an idea that gets overlooked a lot um, that I kind of had to confront with myself in Ecology of Souls to bring it back around mm -hmm. um, is the idea that this stuff is self generated, and people like people tend to get sort of disappointed when I say that, and I I get it because I want it to be some sort of exteriorized other, but. Mm -hmm. um, that's always something that has to be on the table, you know, and, and, and just, it, it can be you and your spirit guide at the same time. And that's sort of, again, we're talking about theosophy, <laughs> that's sort yeah. of like, you know, almost theosophical higher self sort of idea. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's an idea that you have to confront if you're being, you know, sort of honest with yourself about mm -hmm. where these things come from. And I didn't, I didn't want to discuss it in the book, but I was like, well, it's the soul thing and you kind of have yeah. to bring it in there. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, I, I do think we're going to be, we as a community are going to be um, validated by the widespread acceptance of sci phenomena. I mean, it's just, there's too much good research. There's too many people doing good work out there. The only reason that it has been accepted at this point is because it's, it's paradigm shifting, but there's been some great research that's been done playing by the materialists physicists and scientists rules right mm -hmm. um but the one thing that we will never be able to prove i don't think is the idea of you know are quote unquote spirits real or are right. they just voices in your head you know right. are they are they your intentionality made manifest and that's just mm -hmm. something that we're just gonna i think that's just a, that's a, an ambiguity that we're just gonna have to sit with for a long time so you know the other thing i would say is 
be very skeptical and be oh, very, I am. <laughs> like, like even if you are interacting with something, like it could say a lot of things. That's, oh, that's yeah. the, the old Swedenborgism, right? You know, be, you know, whenever you speak to the spirits, know that they're always lying. You know, they're yeah. always lying liars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's, yep. that's, 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 that's fascinating. I can't wait to hear the follow-up on that. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was pretty excited to get that. So now I'm going to have to research that one for sure. <laughs> I, I used to be super suspicious of a lot of modern technological interactions, I suppose, with the other world, be it particularly apps, but even before that spirit boxes that are you know, yeah. picking up words from radio stations and things. But then I thought there's another paradigm that also I think Ecology of Souls could well fit to explain. I know mm -hmm. it's one you really dislike because it's you mention it in the book. Joshua and I know we've talked about it before yeah, and that's yeah. and that simulation theory not so much necessarily that we're trapped in a matrix style virtual reality oh, but that older yeah. tradition which goes back to neoplatonism and goes right. back to gnosticism and even through like the musings of people like Descartes the idea that somehow this reality mightn't be what we think it is and there are higher realities above us that maybe mm -hmm drop in and interject with us. The type of stuff that PK Dick was supposedly experiencing. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Is It's like, my problem with simulation theory is that people are so literalist and quite frankly materialist about it. And it's just a bunch of kids who saw the Matrix but never read PK <laughs> Dick, right? Yeah, they never right. read PK Dick, but they saw the Matrix and thought it was like this new original idea. And yeah. I'm like... My problem is when you start saying, oh, we're living in a computer program, that anthropomorphizes whatever that next level is. And I think yeah. that's, just a, that's a basic first order logical fallacy. Um, so, yeah, in terms of like simulation theory in that broader sense, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to it. But as far as like, oh, I'm going to, you know, die and I'm going to wake up and be like, that was a great video game, boss. <laughs> yeah, that's back I'm like, yeah. you know. This, this, yeah. the idea that the idea that whatever reality we're embedded in would be like a macrocosm of what we've created in this reality, I think, is just. It's, there's a lot of assumptions there. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's a few passages in the book, or a few sections in the book that made me think about that when I was reading it as well. And one is, I'm for, I forget now who you reference. I should have written it down, but it was somebody, and I've heard similar things before that. The ETs are somehow, you know, soul wardens are almost like they're keeping us trapped and keeping us in prison on this planet. And that fits with old and Gnostic traditions of archons and other entities mm -hmm. that don't let us evolve beyond this planet. So I saw some similarities. There yeah, probably well. not probably Nigel Kerner or somebody like that. The idea that greys are soul harvesting or, you know, and, and I again like for to be as big as this this book these these two books are, um there are so many like different directions that I could have taken it and really dug in. Like, you know, I, I didn't roll up my sleeves and dive into Gnosticism. Cause I, again, hopefully that the idea is that people can take this and say, Oh, this is, mm -hmm. you know, an interesting idea. Let's expand on it. Like I just, I, that's, yeah, that's, that's why I, I guess that's why I become something of an in note fetishist is because like, <laughs> is because I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to. And I didn't think this would ever be the case, but I can't tell you how many people I've talked to with my work that have that have come to me and said you know i really enjoyed your book but because you included references i was able to go down in my own rabbit hole and they've just found yeah. this entire you know wellspring mm -hmm. of something else that i hadn't even considered or i didn't have the time to talk about and that's just that's really really gratifying to me for yeah sure. i think i think it's it's the way academia is always operated like you can't just you can't just espouse something in the academy and i, I <laughs> right. pretend it's yours and not give it a source which you always do you go this is somebody's idea or or, or just throw out a case throw out an example and not say where you got it from because you could be yeah. making it up whole cloth you know so it's wonderful that your book lets people who are interested either in the the theory you present or traveling off in their own direction that they can, that the, the trails are all there for them to jump on board and travel down. Well, and you know, the other thing for people who are thinking about writing their own book, like that I cannot emphasize enough is that it's also kind of, uh, it's also kind of functions as a form of insurance, right? Like I say something and if it turns out to be a hoax case years later, I can say, well, you can see when it was written and you can see where I got it from. Like mm -hmm. it's kind of not my problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In a lot let's, of ways. Yeah. yeah. No, let's, let's talk about hoaxes as well. Cause it's something mm. I'm very conscious of when I work in this type of material, whether it was when I was doing my dissertation or stuff I'm working on now is when you do case selection, like when something really juicy, you know what I mean? Comes across your desk and you're like, this perfectly fits this, you know, this angle that I'm writing on. 
it's it's difficult. It always has been for me to make that decision. Well, I think this is just a hoax, but it fits it so well. Perhaps I think it might have been somebody like Keel who suggested we need to we need to watch the hoaxes as well because they mm -hmm. they might be saying something which has genuine truth or resonance or is you know there's something else going on there. But are, are you conscious of that when you're like taking out cases? You're like, well, this one sounds a little dodgy to me. But I uh, know. I mean, it, so I always run into this thing. I've talked with friends in <laughs> these parts of the world about it. Uh, a good example is I've talked with uh, my friend Miguel Romero about this. I'm like, Miguel, I said, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just asking you, do a lot of these stories from Latin America just seem absolutely nuts to you? And he's like, no, they, they, they do to me as well. You know, someone who lives in Mexico, like it, I, they have a completely different flavor than the American cases. And you can say the same thing about, you know, the cases that come from, you know, Russia and those former Eastern Bloc states, like they're just always really elaborate and kind of goofy. And, you know, I, I have a little bit of a vetting process. Um, you know, if, if it's an outright hoax, I don't put it in. If it's a hoax that can illustrate something, I'll put it in, but say it's a hoax, but maybe there's some sort of thought form manifestation going on here, or maybe the hoax is somehow illustrative of the way the culture is thinking or, but you know, so many of these cases really don't ever have follow-up. I mean, I would say like, you know, probably 95% of, you know, quote unquote paranormal cases don't have that follow-up. So you look and see at the person's reputation. Like there are plenty of cases, plenty of things that Phil and Brogno has said that I honestly probably could include, right? Because I think that some of his thinking was interesting, and I'm sure some some of the things that he said happened happened to him, but there's a certain taint there that you can never sort of get away from. So, you know, I sort of look into who said it, and if, if it's if it's if it falls into that sort of upper echelon of, of cases that have received scrutiny, then it, it's, it either gets mentioned or it gets thrown out or included, depending on how strong it somebody says. But with so many of these cases, there's just they're just sort of one offs that have been mentioned here and there, and I'm sure they've been repeated and have permutated over time and details have changed and at some point you just say well this is what it is and that's another form of insurance that i try to do is i try to not find like one case that illustrates a point right i, be, I try to be like these three cases all is illustrate the same point so in case it comes down the line that one of them is you know com a complete fabrication then it's like okay cool these other two you know <laughs> that's that was sort of my, my philosophy from a trojan feast i i thought about this a lot and i was just like well just include a ton of examples of each one so that you know if one does end up being revealed as being a fabrication you're still like okay well the trend still seems to stand mm -hmm. because there are so many other examples of this mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to see the contactees in there who are often dismissed but obviously they fit that older theosophical type tradition yeah. and what they were saying was as important as anybody else and do the hoax thing again just quickly or maybe if you if somebody wants to doubt the legitimacy of i don't know adamski for example maybe if we're talking about the type of like the co-creation theory that you mentioned several times that greg bishop proposed mm -hmm. in um in that reframing the debate book where he had the essay the essay in that or whether we're talking about an imaginal type world which is partly dependent upon our imagination and partly dependent upon you know this interaction maybe the hoaxes or the people who are fabricating or imagining i mean imagining not in the imaginal sense but just making it up in their mind maybe somehow those things are saying as much about us as the perhaps genuine cases so i think it's imp I, I myself think it's important to look at those things as well it, yeah and i guess that's maybe something i inherited from greg is, is my love of contactees because at first like it's the first thing that you throw out when you're looking at the uf when you're new to the ufo question right mm -hmm. um but then you start you know looking at this from the perspective which is a very george p hansen perspective that something happens to people and they're sort of they share it with people and it was something genuinely anomalous but then they start getting wrapped up in their own cult of personality and they have to be start re, you know repeating results and sort of it sort of gets out of their out of their control and you see this in poltergeist cases a lot you see it in hauntings a lot and i would imagine something similar is going on with some of those contact t cases um but yeah i think that they're important to include in there because they do illustrate and this is my academic ease coming out but they do illustrate that as i like to call it prisca ufologia right so the idea of prisca prisca theologia is the idea of the first or like you know uh -huh. mankind's humankind's first religion that we had prisca ufologia the, the the way that we first interacted with the ufo phenomenon was was a spiritual discipline and it sort of gotten got taken out of that by people who were i would argue at this point kind of technological fetishists themselves um 
so yeah so there's a little bit of that and you know i think you have to sort of situate the contactees in there and take them with a grain of salt um which is why I always like to use those words claimed or seems to. <laughs> like, I'll use those as much as you can. Um, but I think they do have a lot to teach us about those sort of early days. And again, like how much of, I'm sure this would go over like a lead balloon at a UFO conference, but like so much of ufology is also tied into theosophy. And mm-hmm. when you when you say that it's just little green men in space machines, you ignore the fact that you have so much baggage that you're bringing into that equation. That's really from a spiritual discipline, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, the, the influence of people like Adamski early on, despite maybe yeah. Kehoe and everybody <clears throat> ignoring them, those early polls, which were done, there was a poll. I can't remember when it was uh, like, it was probably mid fifties and it, it polled UFO readers, right? Or people who believed in UFOs. And they, they, they encountered the influence, they encountered or they described the books of Kehoe as much as they did the books of Adamski. Like the UFO community grew up definitely under that influence mm-hmm. of those theosophical ideas of the contactees as well. And you see yeah. that, it, you see that in much abduction law, it's just painted slightly differently. As you point out in that book, I mean, it's, it's very clear that there's an ongoing kind of mantra traveling through what these things are telling us whether it's nordic folks talking to a damsky or whether it's a little gray man grabbing somebody from their bed well e- even in the rejection of the space brother narrative the sort of gray alien abductions that you see in the 70s through the 80s and 90s it's almost like a one-for-one refutation of these things i mean you know the contactees were voluntary pleasant um and uh all the foods tasted good and all the smells smelled good and the abduction experience is uh, involuntary and unpleasant everything's under duress all the smells are bad all the tastes are bad you know you're getting in, you're not getting being served food you're getting an injection it's almost like a complete reflection of it and because it's a complete reflection of that then yes it is as much ingrained in or i'd even say a reaction to the contactees mm-hmm. it's as much ingrained in contactee lore as as the contactee stuff itself because it almost yeah. seems to be like a a reaction that we produced and that's when you start saying how much of this are we playing into this you know it's just yeah question upon question where do, where do you see ufology going in the next 10 years you know it's kind of funny i uh i had e- even in the time since i got into this which is relatively recent honestly um i saw a distinct change into more and more embracing of altered states of consciousness and embracing some of these alternative ideas. I, I, I saw that before my eyes, sort of not rejecting the ETH, which I don't think we should ever reject, but like embracing other ideas about what these things could be. And then, man, that New York Times article dropped and we were right back to talking about crashes and anti-gravity propulsion systems and aliens and all this stuff. And that kind of makes me wonder if, uh, you know, if if uh, we were getting a little bit too close to the target, you know, by, by looking in other directions. So I think that there's going to be this sort of, you know, technological fetishism that keeps coming along. I just saw something posted the other day that was trying to claim that uh, the balls of light seen in poltergeist cases and in the poltergeist manifestation that abductees have in their homes, those aren't, you know, anything metaphysical. Those are, you know, type four drones or something. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Like, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's incorrect, but like, that's that's there's so many levels of speculation there that don't have a lot of folkloric and <laughs> religious backup. So where does ufology go? I don't know. I think it's going to keep chasing its own tail. I think I think a good idea for where ufology is going to go is to probably look at where we were in a similar geopolitical climate and graft it onto this. And so you're looking at the Cold War again and the sort of undermining of these organizations, um, the continued crowdsourcing of uh, populations to look for strange things in the sky when actually these military uh, intelligence agencies want you to be looking for foreign technology. You know, I think it's going to sort of chase its own tail and there are going to be people on the fringes who keep on trying to say, but what about this? But what about this? And, uh, you know, if I would be so bold and I wouldn't, but if I would be so bold to say that, my workout lasts me it'll probably be one of those things that nobody really appreciates until 20 or 30 years after i'm dead (laughs) it's probably the way to or or when i'm too old and infirm to care about all the love and accolades that i get (laughs) um so yeah i I just think that you know old 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 habits die hard and i think that it's not going to be as strong in that sort of eth camp as it was i think there's a lot more room for a lot of interesting ideas but i think that uh you know it takes a long time to turn around an aircraft carrier doesn't it 
Yeah. I think one of the problems with ufology, like a lot of these type of pseudo scientific endeavors, and I don't mean that dismissively, but they place themselves in the, they want to be scientific. So they become pseudo scientific by default yeah. is that I, 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 I can't believe that there is a UFO phenomenon. There's UFO phenomena. Like if I see a light at the yeah, back of my back yeah. 40 tonight, that might be different to what somebody thought was chasing their car. I mean, one could have been swamp gas. Maybe not. Maybe it was a spirit of the dead. One might be the planet Venus and something that stands next to Jen's bed and wakes her up tonight. Maybe that really is extraterrestrial or maybe that's not extraterrestrial again. Maybe that is a spirit guide or something. So my point is all, there might be so many different things, but the ETH people seem to want to lump all this together. Like Tic Tac, yeah. is, to be honest, Tic Tac's probably just government technology. I, I, I quite sincerely believe that. But let's say even if it isn't, they want that to be extraterrestrial. They want the weird light to be extraterrestrial. They want the thing next to the bed to be extraterrestrial. Everything, as you were talking about the drones yeah. before, <laughs> instead of yeah, I mean, guys, lights, everything has to fit that paradigm yeah. or it's just, you know, it's not that it's ignored. Well, it's just all bought into the paradigm. Maybe so, Bigfoot's so I mean ignored. I want to be clear that I, I do this a lot too. I think part of the reason that I do that is because it's a reaction, right? <laughs> to, to seeing that sort of behavior. But <laughs> right. you know, when, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know? Um, and uh, you know, yeah, you see the exact same thing where they're trying to go back and say that all the religious visions were, um, you know, extraterrestrials too, which I mean, maybe they are, but that's something that I'm, I am guilty of is wanting to say that there is a, is a solution. And I think that even, if we do have genuine anomalies going on, which I suspect that there are, it's, you know, 80% misidentifications. And then that last 20% is a real hodgepodge, you know, it's psi phenomena and maybe some ET, who knows, and government technology and poorly understood weather phenomena. And let's put, throw in a, you know, let's throw in James Trevor Constable's <laughs> sky creatures in there right. for good measure. You know, I think there's probably a lot of different things. And I'm, I'm guilty of just trying to put a one size fits all answer on it too. So like, can't cast blame in that regard but yeah it's, it's something that's endemic in, in a lot of these fields it's all going to be one thing or no thing you know yeah it's, so, and, it's, it's you know, it's, and it's that sort of like sorry this is a little bit of a soapbox i've been on lately but i had this uh, conversation with a colleague recently and, and i and i came to a realization which is like if, if you're looking at these things as a binary like my life's goal is to prove whether or not you know aliens are ufos are aliens and they exist so that's so you're painting yourself into this binary and if you get to the end of your life and i don't think this would ever happen but if you get to the end of your life and you're handed that answer on a silver platter where you know definitively one way or the other there's a 50 50 shot that you just wasted your entire life right <laughs> but if you approach this and this is my philosophy if you approach it from a psychosocial angle if you approach it from an angle that's trying to look at uh sort of cultural expectations and all these things you know even if they're aren't any ufos in the, or ufos that are genuinely anomalous maybe they're all not maybe they're all mundane you still learn something along the way about the human condition you still learn something about the way that we interface with our reality and the way that we interface with our world and, and how we treat each other like you learn so much along the way and i think that's a in my opinion a kind of solid argument for viewing it that way I mean, ultimately, if there's nothing else to it, there's that. It tells us something about ourselves, and we can't mm -hmm. much more than yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Jen, did you have any other questions for Joshua? Because I've dominated or stolen this conversation for the most part. <laughs> uh, well, I do have one little question, because I, I love the fact that you're so interested in, in the Fae. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned in the book was that there was – Different colors that Fay would just dis display around death, or mm -hmm. there were different colors of Fay. Do you want to talk on that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I guess I could speak sort of broadly about this. Okay. Um, it, the, the the sort of types of fairy colors that you see mm -hmm. are kind of inconsistent and regionally defined. So you'll find like fairies in one part of the world who absolutely hate a color that another set of fairies yeah. love. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you'll find uh, numerous allusions to the fact that like green is their color. Right. And uh, of course, green has surprisingly enough, a lot of connotations with death and fertility and rebirth, you know, green, the green of rot and the green of new vegetation. Um, yeah. Kind of gets interesting because some of the uh, older Celtic words sort of mix uh, green and I believe gray and blue are all kind of one similar word. So it's 
exactly how we parse all that out. But you'll find numerous, you know, references to not wearing green when you go out if you don't want to have the fairies be upset with you. I believe, if yeah. memory serves, there was even a, a post office fire in Nova Scotia one year uh, that was blamed on the post office issuing green stamps, and they <laughs> they irritated the fairies. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so there's always been that prohibition. Um, and then you'll find references to fairies, um, you know, hating the color red and uh the reason for that is one of several things you'll hear again often contradictory that's the way the fairy lore works um that either reminds them of fire which you know fairies were always terrified mm -hmm. of fire being a purificatory um process right it's cremation it's sterilization it's all those things um, mm -hmm. But also uh, the red reminding of the, them of the fact that they are indeed bloodless. And you got to say, okay, well, is that some sort of, you know, cultural encoding of, of lividity? You know, what happens after death or even, you know, after, yeah. after you've decomposed. But at the same time, you'll find the English red caps who uh, would, you know, sort of have red caps and they possibly get them from dipping or filling up or I believe dipping their, their caps in the blood of, of people that they, that they killed very nasty mm. fairies, the red caps. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's just this wild victory thing that you'll find from time to time. Um, and of course there's always the color white, which, you know, a lot of the banshees were, were, uh, yeah. women in white more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I just found that so, yeah. portion fascinating. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's so frustrating to write about the fairy stuff because it's, it, it's it's miraculous in the way that it's super consistent from you know old world to new world even sometimes but yeah. even within the region you'll find like conflicting stories like oh always wear a red thread or never wear a red thread and it's like <laughs> yeah. what am i supposed to do you know <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes it's like super consistent and super specific and you're like what is going on here yeah yeah it's fascinating yeah, to find out how they came up with all those the theories and stories and you yeah. know yeah, and you know, I mean, there's there's a book that's called I think it's called British Fairy Origins by Lewis Spence, and it it almost mm -hmm. is kind of that 1300s passport to Magonia that I was mentioning, where it's saying like, yeah. look at how much the fairies resemble the dead. Um, and you know, that's true. Like pre again pre Theosophy, a lot of times we would have thought of fairies and the dead, um, if not being one and the same, being intimately connected. Yeah, yeah I want uh, yeah. We should have you on just to talk about fairies on that one time. Yeah, that's one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite, favorite I'd, I'd topics. I'd, I'd love to. You know, I'm 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 here anytime you call. You send up the the uh, the cut signal and I'll uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll respond. Oh, I will. Well, again, I've, I've seen a number of people say they've either bought your books or they're going oh, to buy them, and I can't yeah. recommend. And I've got the companion as well. If you love footnotes like I do, you're going to want to mm -hmm. have the companion. Do have also. to say, I do have to say, the the companion is for is for uh, print aficionados, especially print aficionados like myself, because I was trying to save on space because the books are so long, and you, it's in the companion, as you can see, is like a three hundred pages long in and of itself. But I also feel like if you buy books one and two, you shouldn't have to pay to get the references, right? Like you should get references. So the entire um, content of the companion is also available on my website. There's a URL in volumes one and two that you can just visit that and download the PDF yourself. So you're not forced to buy the companion. You can buy the companion if you just want to see it on your shelf like I do. So that's the logic behind that. Although I will say um, about, a th from what I can tell, about a third of every... Uh, set that's been sold has included the companion so oh, excellent. apparently there are people out there who still love physical media and that warms my heart greatly yeah yeah i had to get it as well needless to say yeah. but can you can you tell people how they can catch up whatever you're you're getting up to your appearances everything else and where they can get your books absolutely um you can go to joshua uh j-o-s-h-u-a sorry j-o-s-h-u-a-c-u-t-c-h-i-n.com uh and it has uh links to all of uh my upcoming uh conferences i just finally got done with conference season it was the busiest i've been but it was a, it was a lot of fun um upcoming conferences uh links to all my books um you know as I get them, I'm signing and sending out Ecology of Souls directly from me. I do a deal if you get them from me in person. Um, uh, 
and uh, of course I'm, I'm out now because I just <laughs> sold out of them. But um, I do that, and and also you can link, look at my uh, all my old interviews and stuff uh, that are linked there. Uh, as far as upcoming events, I do have an event through the uh, <clears throat> the Morbin Anatomy Museum. Uh, I'm doing an online talk on uh, November 21st from 7 to 8:30 p.m. Uh, and it's Soulcraft: Understanding the UFO as a Death Symbol. Uh, or less uh, an illustrated walk through one of the chapters of the book as best you can in an hour. <laughs> um, but uh, the tickets for that can be found at morbidanatomy.org. And that's going to be an online uh, zoom presentation. So if anybody wants to check that out, that's, that's probably the next event quote unquote that I'm going to be doing. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I might check that out myself, actually a great joy talking to you again, as always though. So yes. thank you so much for coming on the show. And until we talk to you next time, mate, keep it weird. Yes, sir.